Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Welcome to today's message from Harvest Chapel International. We believe the message will be a blessing to you as you imbibe God's truth. God bless you. And young people, thankfully, are more malleable and more pliable than the older ones. The Bible, I mean, it's, it's said that, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. So um, the second reason also is that there's a lot of corruption. Please pay attention to me. There's a lot of corruption that has gotten into the body of Christ today. And it requires teaching, teaching so that we can deviate from the status quo and align ourselves with the word of God. Because otherwise, there's no vacuum. So if we don't, if we don't get enough teaching, we will automatically be following in the things that already have come into the church, which are not in alignment with the word of God. Hallelujah. So I'm speaking to you, you today, as if you were full grown adults, as if you were, you know, the older ones. We're talking about working well together. Now, if we were going to build a kingdom, it is imperative that we work well together. There's no, there's no option. We must work well together. And my emphasis today is working well together while recognizing order and structure. We need to realize that in working well together as a team, there's order and there's structure. The, a body has many parts and each part has to play their own role. The body will do well if each of the parts is, each of the parts is doing the work that it's supposed to be doing. So the hand is working well, the eyes are working well, the head is working well, each segment is playing its own part, then the body together is working well. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 16, it says, By whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. The effectual working of the measure in every part. So I'm going to be speaking briefly about something which I believe is very important. And um, we need to acknowledge the roles and responsibilities of each part of the body. So in the body, I'm looking at the body of Christ, I'm looking at the church, I'm looking at the family system, and we need to acknowledge leadership and followership. You know, the devil is after our togetherness, he's after our unity, he's after our oneness, because he knows that if he can break that, he can hamper the work of God. Even in the kingdom of darkness, there's order, there's structure, there are principalities, there's powers, there's rulers of darkness, there's a whole setup. One, somebody, I don't remember who it was, was giving a, a revelation about the kingdom of darkness and said they are structured even like the u.s army there's order amen and um these things work because there's a system which is undergirded by a very important factor which is what i want to speak today about obedience obedience if you look at islam for instance i believe that the strength of islam is in their strict obedience they brainwash you from childhood such that by the time you grow up, they can even, even if it means you taking your life, especially the extremists, even if it means you taking your life, you're willing to go that mile to obey an order that's been given because you've been brainwashed. And they have that, that culture of obedience in them. And so these things must be taught. We cannot assume that it is automatic because it's not. Because otherwise we'll be breeding a generation of rebellious people. And as I go along, you see that there are more rebellious people in the church than you may even realize. And some maybe you're thinking that I'm an obedient person, but you know what? The real proof of a thing is when it's put to the test. You can't say that you have, you can't say that you are patient, for instance, until you get into a situation where everything in you is asking you to rise up and act against what is being done or being said. You can't say that you are submissive until you're in a situation where everything in you says, show the person that you to you day, show the person that you to you have a voice. But then you decide in spite of that to submit yourself that's when you know that you really have these virtues hallelujah hallelujah and so you know rebellion rebellion is becoming is becoming a culture in the house today and that culture has to break and give way to submission and obedience today people just do what they want to do they don't want to be told anything you know but that kind of that kind of attitude we cannot work well together because there's order there's structure there's there's discipline the instructions that are given and so if we're not obeying and cooperating with the order and with the leadership we cannot be working well together and so it is a fundamental requirement obedience is a fundamental requirement however i find that is one of the most difficult things to get from a group of people one of the most difficult things to get and it's not always easy to obey because obedience sometimes means that your pride is going to have to give way 
It sometimes means that your ego is going to have to give way. It sometimes means that you're going to have to lose something. So obedience is not always an, an easy thing. I want us to um, look at a few scriptures and then we'll see examples of obedience in the Bible. First one is 1 Samuel chapter 3. And I want to read from verse 1 to verse 9. 1 Samuel 3, verse 1 to 9. I'm sure you know the, script, the story, but I'll still read it. It says, and the, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim, that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran to Eli and said, Here, here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call, me, didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Verse 9. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. I'm sure you know the story. Um, Samuel was... A child who had been brought into the temple since he had been weaned from his mother and he was living under the instruction of Eli. Now Eli, we could say, was close to a backslidden priest. The Bible says about Eli, during the tenure of Eli as the prophet, as the priest, as the spiritual authority at the time, that visions became rare. The word of God was precious, the Bible says in the King James. So in his capacity as spiritual leader, there was not much open vision. The word of God was not very clear. Second thing that shows that Eli was not very effective in his ministry is that he was unable to control his family. We know about Hophni and Phinehas. Hophni and Phinehas were sleeping with the women. They were misusing the things in the temple and all of that. But First Timothy chapter 3, verse 4, it says that about a bishop, he must know how to keep his family under subjection and keep his children under order. And he says in verse 5 that if he cannot... If he cannot manage his own house, how shall he manage the house of God? So here Eli is, and he is not being effective in managing the house of God, of, in, having, in managing his own children. And so it raises a question, how well was he managing the house of God? But in spite of that, the Bible says that Eli perceived that the Lord had called his child. I'm talking about obedience. See, you may, you may seem to be more anointed than your leader. You may seem to be holier, more prayerful, more experienced than your leader. But your leader has got something that you haven't got. Your pastor has got something that you haven't got. And so there's, there's a saying that what your leader can see lying down on a bed, you cannot see if you were standing on a rooftop. And there are times when your leader, even without praying, can hear God better than you. This is Eli. Eli, not, that's not to say God didn't use him in a significant way. He did, but at this time, he had lost his cutting edge. But in spite of that state in which he was, he was able to perceive that God had called him. So if Samuel was not an obedient person, he would have missed the call on his life because of that act of disobedience. Hallelujah. I want us to see the second thing in 1 Samuel 15, still about Samuel, but this time in relation to Saul. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, um, this was it's a very long one, so I'll just summarize um, it was an account where Samuel spoke to Saul and he told him to go and fight the Amalekites and to destroy everything. He says, destroy the king, destroy the land, destroy the animals, everything, the plants, everything. So verse, chapter, one, verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 1 says, Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. Listen now to the message from the Lord. So... Saul goes and he fights the Amalekites and he wins but then he does not kill Agag the king he comes back with Agag he comes back with the good of the land because he says that I'm coming to sacrifice the good of the land unto the Lord and um, God reveals this to Samuel and Samuel goes to Saul and asks him why did you do this why did you do this and there are many lessons that we can we can learn from this scripture 
But the first one that I want us to pay attention to in verse 1, it says that Samuel said to Saul, I am the one, I Samuel, I'm the one who the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. And so because of this, because of the fact that I am the one who anointed you, listen. Because I anointed you, because I am your shepherd, because I'm your, I am your pastor, because I am your leader, listen. That shows that our pastors and our leaders have the right to instruct us once god has put them over you he has the right to instruct and it's not even only about ministerial affairs even in personal affairs and if anything goes wrong i mean some people who some people think that well it's my life it's i'm the one who is experiencing what i'm experiencing so nobody has the right to tell me what to do but if anything goes wrong god will hold them accountable but it's wrong in it's wrong if we out of pride and out of arrogance try to run our own lives the Bible says in Hebrews 13 17, it says that obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. This is from the NLT. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Some versions say submit to the authority. And it says that their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. They are accountable to God. And so sometimes the voice of your leader is the voice of God. I'm talking about obedience. Sometimes the voice of your leader is the voice of God someone comes and says that this is the message this is the order that i'm giving you go and do such and such and such but saul did not receive this message in a vision it came from a man hallelujah it came from a man so are you being disobedient to your leader because he's not coming to you in a prophet prophet overall and prophets show and saying to you in a deep voice like mine my son my son hear the voice of the lord if you are waiting for that you are going to miss a loss because sometimes like i'm saying the voice of your leader is the voice of god so if you are disrespecting and disregarding the authority of the leader you're disrespecting and disregarding the authority of god over your life hallelujah and we need to learn not to argue today you say the leaders or well, the head says a and you have so many things to say about that we need to learn to just submit and not to argue this that i'm talking about on obedience also is in line with submission and so the the verse 17 i want to read the verse 17 and the verse 24 it says someone speaking the lord anointed you king over israel 17b the lord anointed you king over israel i'm trying to show you how that the voice of the leader and the voice of god sometimes is the same and then in verse 24 also it says that after Samuel, after saul had realized the sin he said i have sinned i violated the lord's command and your instruction so we know that Samuel is the one who poured the oil on, on, on Saul. Samuel is the one who anointed him. But he comes and says that the Lord anointed you king over Israel. What does that mean? Sometimes the Lord and your leader, I'm saying this without sounding pretentious. Sometimes the voice, sometimes the Lord and your leader could be interchangeable. So we're making big mistakes if we cannot submit to the authority of the leaders that God places over us. Hallelujah. The next thing I want us to see is in verse 13. Verse 13. Verse 13. It says that when Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instruction. Saul now is determining how well he's done. He says, I have carried out the Lord's instruction. Verse 19. It says, Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? In verse 20, he says again, But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. You know, sometimes we may think that we are in obedience, but in actual fact, we are in gross disobedience. Because the standards are not ourselves. The standard is God. So if you are, if you are in partial obedience, you are in disobedience. Here he says, go and kill everything. And then Saul goes and he kills what he wants to kill. And he leaves the rest and says, I have done what God has asked me to do. But Samuel is saying to him, why have you disobeyed the Lord? Why have you disobeyed the Lord? Why have you disobeyed the Lord? So partial obedience is disobedience. I want to run through quickly. The next thing, verse 22. This is a very common 
scripture it says but someone replied does the law delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the lord and he says that to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams to be, to obey is better than sacrifice king james says and to hearken than the fat of rams to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of, ram, of rams so sacrifice is a good thing sacrifice is a very good thing but then it is misplaced priority to go about so you can sacrifice as much as you can sacrifice your money sacrifice your time sacrifice anything it's misplaced priority if you're sacrificing all of these things but you're living in disobedience hallelujah i hope you're understanding what i'm communicating it says that to obey is better than to sacrifice that's the priority that's the number one obedience and then after obedience is done then the other things can come into place because obedience is better than to sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams and then 23 23 is a very scary one it says that for rebellion is like the sin of divination or witchcraft as king james says and arrogance like the evil of idolatry or otherwise stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance is like the evil of idolatry when i read this i said to myself that could mean that if you're somebody who's working in rebellion and disobedience that means that you and a flesh eating blood drinking which are on the same level you're the same that's what the bible says it said that rebellion is like divination rebellion is like witchcraft and arrogance is like the evil of idolatry so you are the same you know i think that sometimes if we consider things from god's perspective we will not judge people you will remove this, the, the log from your eye before you deal with the speck in people's eyes because some of the things that we criticize and judge we do the same and even worse so if you're somebody who's walking in disobedience somebody who's rebellious you and a witch flying witch in the night you're on the same level you're the same god sees you as the same forgive but you know obedience means sometimes means doing something that you may not understand or may not agree with amen like I said, I'm speaking to you as if you were all grown up. This is what I'm speaking to you. I hope that one day it will help you when you have to, even from now, because there's a lot of disobedience, a lot of rebellion. You just, I mean, I want to do what I want to do. So I'm doing what I want to do. But we need to learn to be in sync with authority, working well together. And I said that obedience sometimes means doing something you may not understand or may not agree with. And I feel sometimes that there are too many thinkers and analysts in the church. They have their, they've got their own entrenched ideas about things. You know, what they believe is what they believe. Where they are standing is where they are standing. And if they don't understand the instruction that is given, they will not move. They will not budge. But you know what? There's no democracy in the house of God. There's no, there's no democracy in a well-functioning system, well-functioning well church system. There's always a voice, a thus saith the Lord. So there's nothing like democracy in the house of God amen and i say this that if you're not willing to obey a leader you have no business being in the group if you're not willing to obey a pastor the pastor the set man of the house you have no business being in the church it's not about convenience it's about obedience it's about putting yourself under putting yourself in submission to the authority on the house amen now i want us to go to the example of jesus jesus is a perfect example even jesus walked in obedience even jesus how much more you in john chapter 17 verse 21 and again this is from the nlt jesus is praying he says that i pray that they will all be one just as you and i are one as you are in me father and i'm in you that they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me i believe that the reason jesus and the father could be one and are one as they are is because of jesus's full obedience full obedience and we cannot really we can't really be one without a culture of obedience because without obedience there cannot be unity there's one direction being given and until we align ourselves with that one direction that is being given we cannot really be one and god cannot fully move in our lives and in our church in hebrews 10 it says wherefore when he cometh into the world he saith sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not but a body hast thou prepared me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure and verse 7 says then said i lo i come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will O god even jesus was walking in obedience he says that my meat is to do the will of of the father and to finish his work 
the will of the father not my own will he had his will but he said his meat was to do the will of the father he says not my will be done but yours be done and in the garden of, of gethsemane this was a big cross that he had to carry he wanted to not have to carry the cross but he says not my will but your will be done so in this thing of obedience we are not disregarding the fact that you may have your own preferences we're not disregarding the fact that you may have your own views and your own ideals but there has to be a yielding your ideas and your thoughts have to be have to be yielded to that of the one in authority amen still talking about about working well together and obedience and so john 12 49 i have a few more scriptures john 12 49 still about jesus he says that for i have not spoken of myself but the father which sent me he gave me a commandment what i should say and what i should speak he gave me a commandment what i should say and what, what i should speak when i was looking at the aspects of obedience in jesus's life it was very amazing so many places he reiterates the fact that everything i'm doing is because of the father everything i'm saying is because of what he says to say and so that's why i'm saying what i'm saying another example is in john 17 16 where jesus answered and he said my doctrine or my message is not mine but his that sent me and here i i may say a few things that may be a little sensitive but in line with this jesus is saying that the message i'm speaking to you comes from the one who sent me the message i'm speaking comes from the one who sent me i i believe that in our church there was a time when we had um, the general church family meeting and pastor Fitz was talking about how some groups of people within the church they organize things and the themes that they give the themes that they give have nothing to do with the theme that is given for the year and he said that that's very wrong and i find that also very very wrong as a matter of fact i think that each of the messages that are being preached every time not only in, not only in tahila but all over the world where it's called harvest every message has to be in accordance with the theme that is given by the man the set man because otherwise we are going our own way jesus says that the message i'm speaking to you is what i have received from the father so everything that we speak must be what we have received from the head amen because we represent him where we go amen we represent him in each of the places somebody's pastor of xy branch because he has been sent by the set man so he's representing him there so the theme given is a theme that is addressed in the in in each of the places hallelujah because a vision is a is a big vision it's bigger than reverend fits it's bigger than tahila and god has called us all to rally along with him so that the vision will see fruition and so we need to be obedient to the call obedient to the directions that are being given so that the vision will see the light of day amen and unfortunately there are many people who if you don't put your foot down and rebuke them and are very hard on them they will not move and i see that with my own small level of <laughs> of leadership if you don't shout and you are not very hard some people just will not move but you know that it's goats who do that goats goats they are the ones who do that there's a goat sheep classification in the bible the bible says jesus says that my sheep they hear my voice however the goats are the stubborn ones in on the last day the goats and the sheep will be separated so if you are the kind of person who unless they are on you rebuking you every day you will not move you need deliverance And here i'm talking about the various levels of leadership so there's ministry heads there's departmental heads there's their pastors their reverends there's the executive council and then there's the bishop himself so different levels of leadership there must be obedience on all of these levels otherwise we cannot work together well we are doing our own things and we're not in in total unity so if you're not working walking in obedience you're not building and if you're not building like pastor Fitz says you're automatically tearing apart so consider your own life on the dip, on the level that you are the leadership level that you are or the followership level that you are are you in obedience are you building or are you tearing apart and i think that the work in this house would be much easier if we had obedience people something as simple as coming to church the order is 
we have service on Tuesday, we have service on Friday. If we had obedient people in the church, we will not struggle to fill this place. Because our membership alone is enough to fill this place, but we are people who are hard of hearing. So even, even though the thing is, we have service on these days, I mean, also on, what do you call it, weekend services. If you're not coming to church on Saturday, be here on Sunday. If you're not here on Sunday, be here on Saturday. The number that is here, look at us. And, and, and what's the true representation of what happens on Sunday? So something as simple and as basic as that, if we can just be obedient, we'll make the work a lot easier. Amen. Now, the centurion, he said to Jesus, when he asked Jesus to heal his servant, he says, I am a man under authority. And he says that I, tell, I say to one, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. Why? Because I'm a man under authority. See, if you sow seeds of rebellion, you will reap seeds of rebellion. Because what goes around comes around. There's a thing we, used, we say in Achimota school. Those of you who didn't go to Achimota school, um, you missed a lot. Thankfully, our bishop is from Achimota school himself. <laughs> it's, we say that you subjugate so that you may rule. You subjugate, that means that you put yourself under. You, you bring yourself down so that you may rule. So if you're, not, if you're not yielding in obedience to the authority that God has set over your lives, a time will come when you will be in a place of authority and you know how people who are following you. Because what you will sow, you will reap. I have a few more minutes. Um, I'll try and touch on the last thing. One other thing which some of us do almost unconsciously because it's something that we have seen done i said from the beginning the many things that we see in the church today which are not right don't just follow the crowd don't just do things because people are doing them look at the word of god and fashion your life accordingly one thing that is very common today is memorying complaining criticizing and talking negatively about pastors it's a very dangerous thing it's a very, 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 very dangerous thing. Nobody is perfect. The men of God are men, so they're not perfect. But if you have nothing good to say about a man of God, don't say anything at all. And I'll give you a few examples. In Numbers chapter 12, Numbers chapter 12, from verse 1, it says that, And Miriam and Aaron spoke against moses they spoke against moses moses was the leader moses the one that god called to lead the people and miriam, miriam and, and aaron they were close to him and it says that they spake against moses because of the ethiopian woman whom he had married for he had married an ethiopian woman verse 2 and they said had the lord indeed spoken only by moses hath he not spoken also by us that's what some people do that's what people say is he the only one who knows is he the only one god speaks to god speaks to me too but no, you're making a mistake. You're making a mistake. It says, and the Lord heard it. The Lord heard it. And because of this, in verse 9, it says, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed. I'm cutting it short because of, of time. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, alas my lord now he's calling him lord alas my lord i beseech thee lay not the sin upon us wherein we have done foolishly and wherein we, we have sinned and these things i'm talking about they 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 are not only in the general church level they exist in our families they exist in our departments it's everywhere but what i'm talking about now is speaking against speaking against the people that god has called you are not the one, you are not the one who called them so you're not in the place to judge them if there's anything you think that is not being done right, pray for them. Pastor Fritz says, that's all. I want, to see, I want us to, to take a second example. Numbers 21, 5, 5 to 6. And the people speak against God and against Moses. Whereof have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. We hate this light bread. That's what it means. And the Bible says that, and the Lord sends fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much of much people of Israel died. They speak against Moses. They speak against God. Rebellion will cost you more than you can you can imagine. 
In Numbers 16, verse 2, this is about Korah. This was, I think, the most dramatic of all. Korah incited some people in rebellion. It says that they incited a rebellion against Moses, along with 250 other leaders of the community, all prominent members of the assembly. And they united against Moses and Aaron and said, you have gone too far. They, the followers, are telling the leader, they are saying, you have gone too far. The whole community of Israel has been set apart by the Lord, and he is with all of us. What right do you have to act as though you are greater than the rest of the Lord's people? Can you imagine? They're talking to your leader this way. In verse 31, he says, He had hardly finished speaking the words when the ground suddenly split open beneath them. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed the men, along with their households and all their followers who were standing with them and everything they owned. 33. So they went down alive into the grave, along with all their belongings. The earth closed over them, and they all vanished from among the people of Israel. Amen. So here is Korah. Korah, now, he's not only acting in rebellion on his own, but he's going to gather groups of people. And that's another thing that we can learn from. Do not entertain disloyal people. When people speak negatively against a leader, against a pastor, against the, the, the head, do not entertain it. Sometimes by your silence alone, you are allowing it. By your inactions, you are allowing it. But we must learn to stand against these things. So Korah goes and he organizes people and they come together foolishly in rebellion against the man that God has set over them, Moses. And they are telling him, he said, they, are, they, they say to him, they say, you have gone too far. And he says that the whole community of Israel has been set apart by the Lord and he's all of us. Saying that God speaks to us just as he speaks to you. What makes you think you're special? What makes you think you're, what makes you think you're different? He says that what rights do you have to act as though you're greater than the rest of the Lord's people? But like I said, even if you think that you're more anointed than your leader, more prayerful than your leader or your pastor, they have got something that you have not got. And so the judgment upon them, the Bible says that the earth opened, they fell in and closed upon them. And that was the end for them. The, the, the fruits of rebellion. In conclusion, change may be uncomfortable. Um, the way that I've, I've shared with you today is as a result of certain observations and um, certain things that have become like a trend and a culture on different levels, like I said, different levels of leadership. But there are things that need to change maybe it's something that you're not used to i mean everybody wants everything comfortable you would prefer to do what you'd want to do it takes it takes it takes killing your pride if somebody tells you to do something that is outside what you wish outside what you think is the best way forward but it is a thing of obedience if we want to really work well together and so we need to learn to change you cannot do the same old things the same old way and we expect different results and I'm saying this to us as youth because they say that the future of the church, the future of the future leaders are the youth, but the future begins today. So if there are things that need to change, they need to change from today. The culture of rebellion, the culture of disobedience needs to change from today. You don't have to wait until you get to a certain point. It has to change from now. On the family level, on the church level, departmental level, everywhere, it has to change from now. We need to learn to submit. We need to, to learn to yield to the authority that God places over us. That's how we can work well together. And that's how we can have unity, which God cannot, can operate in. Because without unity, without oneness, God cannot operate. And so if you're not tearing, if you're not building, you are tearing apart. And this kind of attitude is detrimental to the work of God. So they, we, we come to church and we pray, and prayer warriors, and we are praying that God will increase us as a church, and we're fasting, and we're giving seeds, and doing all sorts of things. But sometimes these little things are the things that draw us back. So don't be, don't be, don't be a reason why the church, the work of God, is not going forward. I know that we are few in this place. I know that maybe you consider yourself as youth. Maybe you can't fully relate. But on your own level, assess yourself. How obedient are you being? Amen. I want us to pray because you know the things that i've spoken about are things that we need grace for and so i want us to for a few minutes pray that god will grant us the grace to be an obedient people 
We want to pray for the spirit of obedience that it will come upon us. And not just for us that are seated here, but for the church as a whole. We're praying for the spirit of obedience because without the spirit of obedience, there's no unity. Without unity, God cannot move in our midst. And the work of God will not go forward as it should. Working together, one very fundamental thing is obedience. So I want us to, to please close our eyes for, and bow your heads for a few minutes while praying that God will help us. Harvest Chapel, that God will help us across the branches all over the world, in this branch also, in our departments, in our families. May the spirit of obedience come upon us. May the culture of obedience be, be ours. In the name of the Lord Jesus, you are praying for yourself. I mean, I have spoken the word. Maybe you've seen the area that you need to change, but you're asking God for grace. That's what has to change in your life, such that you become a submissive person, that God will give you the grace to change that. In the name of Jesus, just pray for a few minutes, asking God for his grace asking him for his grace he says come boldly to the throne room of grace where you obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need this is the time of need we're asking god let grace abound for us may the spirit of rebellion may the spirit of disobedience may it give way and may the spirit of obedience oh god come upon us in the name of the lord jesus i'm praying oh god for grace each one of us in this place each one of us even that are not here as long as we're under the family under the umbrella of harvest chapel lord may be that the spirit of obedience will come upon us for loyalty for total submission to your leadership oh god i'm asking for this grace oh god in the name of the lord jesus let grace abound let grace abound let grace abound let mercy prevail forgive us oh god in the places where we have erred in the places oh god where have been where we have been disobedient in many different areas i'm asking oh god for mercy that you help us oh god by your mercy that you grant us grace lord that we will we'll be able to stand as one that we'll be able to stand as one and work well together and then advance the kingdom of god and advance the work of god father we give you so much praise we give you thanks for this time we think we thank you for your word that has come to us i'm praying oh god that you help us that we'll not be forgetful hearers but we'll be doers of this word please help us as a church please help us as individuals oh god that the spirit of obedience will come upon us that we'll learn to yield that we'll learn to submit that we'll learn to hand over oh god to the authority that you have placed in our in our lives and in our church I thank you for this grace that has been released because we have asked in the name of Jesus. I give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the message. Visit us on www.harvestinternationalministries.org. Send us an email through office at harvestinternationalministries.org or call us on 0302-222-372 or 0302-229-109. God bless you.